that we need to be able to be big enough to put our own personal feelings aside to be able now I know there's people like maybe even in this room, but I know there's people out there that say, hey, cop are crazy now. <laughs> you know, there ain't no way we're gonna work like that. But I am saying that if we could break that, whatever that is, that barrier, to be able to take the sense out of the nonsense. And, and to build things that we need for our people. We don't have to agree with everything, but if there's something we agree on, let's start there. And then build from there. And that goes to all of the areas of the ministries. I mean, I know how I feel about religion. And, and anybody see some of my presentations, you have no doubt in your mind how I feel about it. Certain religions. And I really don't have a problem with the religions. I have a problem with the people who practice the religion. Because every holy book came from Africa. Whether you're dealing with the Torah, the Quran, the Bible, they all came from the walls of ancient Egypt. It's just that the people that call themselves that don't follow what they wrote. They hide behind that, just like the so-called conscious community. That's another thing I'm dealing with. Conscious community. You know, people email me or they Facebook me, they, 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 they instant message me, they say, Brother, I left the Christian church, I left the Democratic Party, and I joined the conscious community, and something I noticed is that you all act just like them. <laughs> and what I tell them is, you act like what? I act like people in the conscious community. I said, but sister, Oh brother, there is no consciousness. A, there is no community of conscious people. There are just people who are conscious. They are in the world community. And to get caught up in this concept of I'm in the conscious community is very much like Christians who claim to be Christian and hide behind their Christianity to do evil deeds and then when you attack them, they say I'm attacking them. Their, their religion. No, I'm not attacking your religion. I'm attacking you because I think that you're psychopathic. <laughs> and you're using that religion as a shield. Yeah. And the same thing goes for the conscious community. So called. And I want to be clear because, again, this is where we are at this point because there are people who are out, on, who are out now having conversations about situations and then they're claiming to be part of the conscious community and if you don't think like them, then you ain't down with the conscious community. But what I'm saying is that there is no conscious community because a consciousness isn't part of a community. It is a state of mind. Yeah, I see. And if you see somebody acting in an inappropriate way, don't think they're part of the conscious community. No. If you see someone acting inappropriate, they are not conscious, so they can't belong to that community. And so don't let them do their little stuff and then claim to be conscious. Mm -hmm. And then want to know why you ain't agreeing. You're psychopathic. There is no conscious community. Dr. Clark did not belong to the conscious community. Dr. Clark belonged to us. And he is conscious. Dr. Ben belongs to us. And he is conscious. And how those brothers acted when they were moving through and doing their work was one where we admired them. They, they spoke in a way that inspired us. And we, we, we can't be coming off with all of them. If you would not want your mama and your baby girl to be at your presentation because how you speak, there's something inappropriate. Yeah. And some of the things that I'm hearing coming from people, you gotta believe that. And we have to be strong enough at this level also to say this. Just as we would say something about other people, we have to look within to see how we can make this better for us. Not by attacking, not by naming names, but just by letting us understand that we have work that we have to do and we have to bring this to our community. Everywhere I study on this, from Kemet to the Moors to the plantation, 
to the Bronx 2014. I've never seen people of Eurasian descent be able to come in and take us over. I've always seen them take advantage of us fighting against ourselves. They don't have the strength to do us, but they can divide and conquer. And that's what I, I, I'm observing. And I say, do you want to solve the problem? You're not going to stop them from portraying black men in dresses and things like that. But brother, what you can do is start acting like a man. And then, if you give Arnold Leishman in his great analogy with Malcolm in the movie, where he takes a clean glass of water and puts dirt in it, or ink, and then he has another that is clean water, and he says, you know, which one will the people choose? If you give them the option of the clean water, they will take the clean water. And we have to be the example. We have to be the living example for our children. And what we say we're going to do, we should do. We as men need to be with them. And it doesn't take blood relationship to do it. It has nothing to do with blood relationship. A father and a son with a blood relationship has a particular relationship. But I also know historically, we never grew up necessarily with a father, with us. Not, I'm, not, I'm talking about during the enslavement time. It was forbidden for men to be fathers to their children. Otherwise, they would have the authority over the child more than the European. So we were never allowed to be the authority in the family. However, as Kunti Kinte, he did have fit. He was Lugasa. There was always a male image on the plantation. There was always a male image in the community that that young man could identify with and know how a man really does act. And so, and so I think that that's really what it is. There is no way, I believe, well, let, let me start from the personal one. Two daughters. There's no way I can teach my daughters how to be a woman. I ain't never been a woman. I don't know those parts of being feminine that when mother look at daughter and she can see things, I can't see. The same thing is with the brothers. It's not that you're not a good mother. It's not that you're doing everything you possibly can for your son. A woman can't teach a young boy how to be a man. No more than a man can teach a young woman how, young girl how to be a woman. It can't be done. It's not part and parcel. That's why the balance needs to be there. And, and that's why I say to us, as brothers, we need to take on that responsibility and not make sisters have to be both mother and father to the child or think that they have to be father. We have to take on that responsibility. We have to be the uncle or the brother or the nephew that come by the house and say, yo, man, you want to hang out today? Come on, let's go. And take them out, do the things they like to do, whatever it may be, and take the responsibility. You know, I, you know ever since the Million Man Month, I've seen the change. Uh, we still have work to do. But I know that after the Million Man March in October, uh, open school night first report card was like in November. And I remember when I used to uh, do the attendance sheet for the parents who came in to see their children on report card night. And I remember that I would have maybe four names on the front of the sheet. The first report card night after the Million Man March. There were some teachers that had three sheets of paper filled with parents' names on both sides, and many of them were men. I've seen a change. I see a lot more brothers with their children, walking with them, pushing the baby carriage. I see a lot more than it was when I was a father, young father. So I think the changes are occurring. I think they may be not at our pace, but at divine pace. And so I think that we just have to do this. But I believe it comes from us. And, and our encouragement of our young people, our young sisters as well as our young brothers, that, hey, it's all right. We're, we're going to make this happen. We've got to work with you. And this is how, if you ever need uh, support, if you need, if, if you need to talk to somebody, I don't think it's hard. I think it's just a matter of talking. How, how you doing? 
you know, like I do with my son's friends. Years, I was really like their father. They used to come up to the house. Hey, Mr. Hey, uh, they used to call me Mr. Coleman because they didn't, you know, her, you know, her rules last day. I didn't change the family name, I just changed mine. So my family still has Coleman as a last name, and I have a common name. So they, when they come in, hey, Mr. Coleman, how you doing? Hey, bro, what's going on, man? How you doing? How's your family doing, bro? How's school? You working hard? What you doing? When they were going through high school, when they were going through college, I took an active interest in it. Didn't hang around talking to them a long period of time, because I knew young people don't want to talk that long. <laughs> you know, I think it's not like that. And, and I know that. But I do know that the amount of time they spent with me, I felt that they had some type of relationship. I see them in the street. Hey, Mr. Coleman. Hey, brother, what's going on, man? How you doing? How's your mama doing? Taking you interest. So I believe that talking to them, no matter what, and not to be judgmental, I see a lot of elders. Pull them pants up. You want to turn them off? Tell them. Because the moment they get past you, whoo, slip down again. See, it goes back to Esau's fable of the, the sun and the wind, the summer and the winter, where there was a man walking on the earth, and winter and summer made a bet that they could make the man take his coat off. And the winter blew and blew and blew and blew. And the more the winter blew, the more the man held tight to his coat. And after all those months of blowing and all that other stuff, all of a sudden now here comes the sun. And in the intense heat of just penetrating on that man, the man freely took his coat. That's how I see our young people. Because I know how I was. You want me not to do something? Tell me to do it. You know, uh, if, they, if there is something that needs to be done, if you explain to them why it needs to be done as opposed to just telling them, I got, when I was brought into a high school, there was a very serious problem with some of the brothers in one of the high schools. And I, I had a meeting uh, with them separately from the principal. And come to find out, uh, one third of the brothers used to wear their hats and doors. And they used to always take their hats off. And that would start a big trouble. Eventually, they would get in big trouble. And so, when we when we met with the principal, I asked one of the brothers to explain to the principal why there was a problem. And the brother said, "You know, because you always take my hat off. You always take my hat, snatching it off my head. You don't want to snatch your hat off the brother. Said. That's one thing you never want. You you barely make it if you tell him to take it off." You're in trouble if you snatch it. The principal did a very great, fine explanation as to why you can't wear hats and doors, as it relates to social custom and we're trying to get you to get a job and whatever it is that you need to do, we need you to understand the social custom. You walk for a job, you got your hat on, uh, you're not going to get the job. So we ask you to, to, to carry yourself in school the way we want you to carry yourself in uh, the workplace. And the brother said, why did you tell us that? You, you never told us that. You just took the hat, snatched it off my head, sometimes hurt my head, pulled my hair, or, you know, and you never explained to us. If we just take the time to explain to our children why we are asking them to do and make a common sense where they say, okay, yo, man, I can't, I can't handle that shit. It makes sense to me. I understand it. And I think that's one of the areas that we are missing in this conversation. At the same time, we must have a level of expectation of respect from the younger to the elder. See, it's a, it, 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 it's a balance that we gotta keep going. Because there's some ways that I, I hear young people speaking to the elders that's just unacceptable. So we have to look at all of these pieces together and very carefully, like a surgeon, cut away at what the problem is and be able to heal ourselves. Please, brother, you have to heal ourselves. Yeah. Uh, you need to be long watched for the back of the YouTube. We get to see you for the barbicide more. Speak up. Since the advent of 
YouTube, you can watch all the elders. And most of the time, when you do research, you look at Dr. Amos Bush, uh, Dr. Neil Fuller, Lily Fuller is practically saying, run from black people. Say that last part again. Lily Fuller is saying, run from black people because unless they got something structured. And then Dr. Claude Anderson is saying, we are a permanent underclass. So, how do we, you know, elevate when you got your number one people out there that's in the forefront saying these things? They are good people, they are great scholars. But I would never accept that. I respect both men very much. But I have an eternal faith in our people and an unconditional love. I know why we do what we do, and I know that we get bitter when we get to a certain point in our lives and we watch. We know what we could do and we're not doing it. I, I listen sometime to another comedian entertainer. And, you know, I, I, I hear, I, you see, I try to stay away from naming you. Yeah. Um, but I see a bitterness, a sadness, a depression in people. And we can't get there. We, we can never lose that hope. Our, our brother, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, passed away in London in 1940, not too long ago with a pen in his hand planning the next move. After people had conspired against him, turned him in, served time in prison, he was an indomitable spirit that told us to look for him in the world. You know, hey, Harriet Tubman didn't do what she did for us to end up like this. Harriet Tubman did what she did because she saw a time beyond us. She, she, like Dr. King, knew we had difficult days there, and we do. You can see it. It's there. But the other side of it is that it ain't over till we win. It, it, to me, it ain't about if, it's when. What do we have to go through before we finally realize what we have to do? How many times would we let schools slip through our fingers before we do what we have to do? We complain when we don't have them, but we don't support them when we do have them. How many times, Bob Marley say, how long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? How long? So my, my concern and my feelings is with, due, with the duest respect to all of those scholars that have blazed a, a, a trail for us. But at the same time, we have to, as a family, and I think myself, as someone who I believe you've called me here because you, you have a respect for my opinion, that I have to give you my opinion and not try to sugarcoat it, but not be disrespectful to my elders at the same time. There's nothing stronger than the indomitable, black, melanated spirit. And don't ever give up is going to be all right. But we got work we got to do. That's how I feel. I quote Dr. Neely Fuller. I quote uh, a number of people. I admire them, I respect them. But I take the sense out the nonsense. And then I keep on trucking. See, I ain't running away from my black folk. I'm running to you. You know? Some I may run around you, but I'm still running towards you. <laughs> some folks scare me, I'm telling you. I remember Richard Bryan did his album. He said when he went to prison, he said he finally understood black people, some black people really do belong in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, when you stop to see it, because we have a glorification. You know, we want to glorify, we want to, oh, there's a wrong reason why they're there, it's because they're black. No, it's because they're criminals. <laughs> And they, they conducted themselves criminally. You know, and, and they need to be put away to give some time to think. Let time serve you, don't serve time. But you need time out. <laughs> you know, just think about what you're doing out here, man. My goodness. Questions, comments? Please, man.
about the civil rights and the culture. Mm -hmm. um, why do you say uh, no one is going to be here? Uh, mm -hmm. What I meant was that we have been the conscious of this community, of this country post 1492 or 1500. In the worst of times, we battled everything that's come our way and succeeded. As you can see, there are many other groups coming to the country from all over the world. And they have done one thing that is incorrect. Wherever I go, I always ask to meet with the elders first. To get a sense of the elders, to get a sense of the community, and to pay respect because it's those elders that built where I'm visiting. Any culture that comes to this country and doesn't sit at the feet of African American people and ask us who we are and what we did, it's like having a service without doing libation. If you don't have libation, the elders are not with you. If you come to this country and you listen to what they tell you about African American people and you believe what they tell, tell you about African American people and you treat African American people as, as not full citizens, then you don't know the history of this country. And there's somewhere along your line that you're going to fall because you have, you have not taken into consideration what African American people have done this African American people and Native American people made America what it was. Native American people showed Eurasians how to survive on the land. African people built the economic system. They did not build this economic system. African people were the Industrial Revolution. And then the machines became the Industrial Revolution. And although I realize that as people observe us and they see us conducting ourselves a certain way, like, like, like with Miley Cyrus, people say Miley Cyrus act like that because she hangs around black people. No. Miley Cyrus doesn't act like that because she hangs around black people. Miley Cyrus acts like that because she hangs around with people who have bought into the image that white supremacy has for black people. So when you see her, I have seen people twerking in Africa. Okay, black people express themselves with their bodies in the most beautiful, sensual, powerful ways. But nobody has corruption on their mind. This twerking thing is less than decent. When I first went to Africa and I saw our sisters who by all means were anatomically correct. <laughs> and they were and they were well they beautiful. Beautiful. They were beautiful systems, right? And they walked the earth with nothing on top. Okay? I had to lock myself in the hotel room for three days. I was ashamed of myself. <laughs> because I have been poisoned by Western civilization. I can't help it. This is what has happened over these years to me. No, I told you, I'm honest, I tell you the truth. I was ashamed of myself because I said, look how far you've gone away from who you were. The, the other brothers and, and the people there, they, they were just taking it on like it was just happening. It was just another thing. African women can walk in, in communities in Africa dressed that way. Zero cases of physical assault, zero uh, verbal abuse. A sister can't even walk down the street fully clothed in America without hearing something. Because that's 
And that's not our mind. That's their mind that's been implanted in us. Because if it wasn't, I wouldn't have been ashamed of myself. Because I would have learned that from black people. But this is how we are. We've been poisoned in, 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 in many ways. We've been misled, however we want to say it. It's repairable. But every group that comes here, Chinese people, second, third generation, they smoke more ganja than our stuff. Up there in Bronx Science, they blunt. They be kicking the blunt up on the block. Cursing and acting in all sorts of ways. The young ladies are dressing the way in which they see Miley Cyrus and Britney Spears conducting themselves in ways absolutely inappropriate. I was on a bus one time and I, 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 I heard somebody keep using the N-word, N-word, N-word. I'm not going to say it to young people. I, 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 I know you would say it, but I'm holding it alone. N-word, N-word, constantly. And I said, but that don't even sound like black people. It was two Koreans. It's absolutely amazing. So that when you're in this society, this society will make this happen to you. Second, third generation, people come from all parts of the world. When I start observing how their children are acting, I, I, you know, I have a sister from the continent come, and she was in my class, and she used to talk, she used to curse and do things for no reason at all. You know, she, she didn't do it because she was mad. She just did it because it was culture shock. And I said, you know, if you were back home, you would never act like that. And she said, I know. I'm not home. <laughs> Family come in. What are we going to do? This society is crazy. Really messed the child up. Sent her home. Sent her back to Africa. West Africa. Six months later, she came back. She had changed a bit. Grandma, tell them, you are not part of this family. You act like that, you go back where you came from. We, you're not poisoning the children here with that. Send her back to the United States. Because of what happens. Uh, many, of the, many of the children that come in, I'm not just speaking about the continent, I'm speaking about every place and all places. When you come to America, your parents come with this ethic of wanting to work hard and everything is there, give it some time. And, and they act just like they accuse us of acting. That's how I know it's not us, it's the state of mind of what Eurasians put on people in a way that they start to act like us, so they start saying they're acting like us. They're not. They're acting like white supremacists are putting the image on us. Because we don't act like that. And so, if we don't get through, nobody's getting through. And, and that's simply the mechanics of the way America works. And the sooner the people that come that have an opportunity say, you know something? These people that are called African Americans, we are going to do what we have to to help them move through this process. Because we have what we have because of them. Every group that come here come for a better opportunity. That better opportunity was made possible by the struggles of African American people. Just like I said, everybody crossed over. We acted as the bridge from bad times to good times. We were the bridge that everybody crossed over, stepped over us to get to the other side to the better opportunity. But after they got to the other side, nobody turned around and took us by the hand, pulled us up, and said, come on, you're coming with us now. It's because of you that we even got over. Nobody did that. And so we're still struggling with certain situations that we need to correct as an entire community. 
my brother. Yes. Uh, my brother, sister is telling me that the clock on the wall is saying, uh, can, can, can I ask you more uh, uh, Is it all right for us? My, my brother, I, I, I should ask you that question. May, may we have permission for two more questions? Okay, please, my brother. Thank you. My brother. Comment and question. Uh, I love that you have the desire and love for words. That, that really helps me. Because words show ownership. My comment is to everyone here, especially people who are having children, My recommendation, and it's only my recommendation, is that you try to give your children and yourself some of your heritage back by renaming yourself. Because the name that you have is not an African name. It's a name of ownership that you can trace back to the people who own whoever part of your family they own. I love the names of the young ladies, children that were up there today. We have to, my theory has always been, some of the chain that is around your neck can be broken, but you have to find the weakness. And if renaming yourself is the start of breaking that, that chain will start to fall on your I love everything that I've heard you to so many of but one of the things that really hit home was uh, the concept of nation building. Mm -hmm. And that a nation, uh, building a nation is built on families, not on baby daddies, not on baby mamas. And we face a major issue with the entertainment industry, the media, and how they basically portray our people. In fact, it was, as soon as he said that, it made me realize that yesterday, yesterday I was watching the World Cup and they're showing these two African, you know, descendant males, supposed to be twins, and they've got two little boys, son, where's the mothers? And that's subliminally, they're constantly just kind of pulling those images there. You know, some mother just by herself raising the, you know, the whole family, but some male with the family, it takes two, it takes the whole family. And we have to be very careful about that. And the question that I have is how, how can we, as people who are um, really focusing on building nations, shift that in the mind of our youth to make them realize that what we're focusing on is not just an individual, but the bigger picture of building the nation? My brother, the rules, I believe, it goes back to us emulating and representing what we're talking about. When, when my son's friends, when they saw me at home working or whatever, when the room come upstairs, they saw mother out in the living room and the room come in and speak to me, they knew I was there. We have to lead by example. And we have to reach out to the people who are ready to make it happen. I'm looking for three out of a hundred. I would like and would never not embrace everybody, but I just don't have time. I'm through with conversions. If I have to convince you of what I'm saying, there's nothing I can say that will convince you. And if I don't have to convince you, then I don't need to say nothing. Let's just get it on. So I believe we start first by ourselves. Michael Jackson had it right. Start with the man or the woman in the mirror. That's the first thing to change. And, and, oh, you like that too, huh? All right. <laughs> and, and what you do is that as you move through that process, other people will join with you. And, they, and they'll look for your guidance as it relates to how do you relate? You know, when, when my son's friend saw uh, my wife, the whose mother, and I joking with each other, or laughing with each other, or talking with each other, we gave them the opportunity to know that you can be married and you can laugh, you can talk, you can enjoy life. We, we have to do it by, by, by emulating. And by leaving this one, I honestly and truly believe at this point. Because going out to try to convince people of something that they are not ready yet to 
to accept is like waking someone from sleep who is deeper than what we wish they would be. And you know, a lot of times when you wake somebody from sleep, you eventually wish you had just left them sleep because <laughs> they get in your way. And, and they are no use, they're too much in your way. So, it, you know, but if we continue cleaning the house, if we continue doing what we need to do, when they do wake up, they'll be ready to take on the responsibility and maybe we can sit on the couch for them. But, but that's what I honestly believe. I, I really believe we have to start leading by what we do. And if, and if they can see healthy relationships, then we can start to build healthy relationships. If we have these types of activities where the children back there are coming together and they are having fun, that's the beginning in terms of the socialization of our children. And so that activity alone, the school that you create, having a point of socialization, uh, not studying in school, not eating lunch, maybe after lunch you may have a half hour socialization time where you sit, you discuss, you talk, you write in your journal. That's another opportunity. But I think what's going on back there is phenomenal because it's giving them a chance that like minds from like adult minds are back there talking with each other and socializing with each other, and that is how we can get this done, little by little. It took us a while to get in this position, it's going to take us a while to get out. But to, to thy own self, control. You know, uh, and you know, just keep on keeping on. I believe.